and the currents at Owl Creek Bridge by Ambrose Bierce. Story Overview This is the historical story during the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. The North and the South were opposing forces. In the story, the main character named Peyton Farquhar was captured due to trying to sabotage railroad construction by Union soldiers, a bold move that he thought could help the South. But his plan was not success, and he was killed by the Union soldiers by hanging downward beneath Bean Bridge. Here is the story. He was waiting to die. Part 1. A man stood on a bridge in northern Alabama, looking down into the swift water 20 feet below. The man's hands were behind his back, his wrists tied together with a cord. There was a rope around his neck. It was attached to a wooden beam above his head. The man was standing on some boards that served as a temporary platform. Also on the platform were the men who were going to hang him soldiers of the Union Army. A sergeant was directing two of the soldiers. A short distance away from them was a captain who stood silently, his arms folded. At each end of the bridge was a guard holding a rifle. The guard's job was to prevent anyone from coming. Onto the bridge, the man who was about to be hanged was about 35 years of age. He was not wearing a uniform and, judging from his clothes, was quite wealthy. He was a handsome man whose long dark hair was combed straight back. It fell behind his ears to the collar of his well-fitting coat. He had a mustache and a pointed beard, and his large dark gray eyes had a kindly expression. Clearly, this was no common killer. The preparations were now complete. The two soldiers looked at the sergeant. The sergeant turned to the captain, saluted, and waited for the signal the signal that would send the condemned man to his death. The man glanced down at the swirling water of the stream below. A piece of drifting wood caught his attention. His eyes followed it as it bobbed up and down in the current. How slowly it seemed to move. What a sluggish stream. The man closed his eyes and fixed his last thoughts on his wife and children. The water, sparkling brightly in the sun, had bothered him. And now, something new distracted him. It was a sound that he could neither understand nor ignore a sharp, loud banging, like a hammer pounding. It had the same ringing sound. He wondered what it was and whether it was far away or near, for it seemed to be both. The sounds grew louder and stronger. They stabbed his ears like the jabs of a knife. He was afraid that he would scream. What he heard was the ticking of his watch. He opened his eyes and again saw the water below him. If I could free my hands, he thought, I could pull off this noose and jump into the stream. By diving under the water, I could evade the bullets. I could swim swiftly to the shore, run into the woods, and get away to my home. My home, thank goodness, is still outside their lines. My wife and children are still far away from the enemy. These thoughts flashed into the doomed man's brain. And as they did, the captain nodded to the sergeant and gave the signal. Part 2. Peyton Farquhar was a wealthy farmer. He came from an old and highly respected Alabama family. Farquhar was a southerner who believed very strongly in the cause of the South. Certain things had happened that prevented him from joining the army and taking part in the fight against the North. Farquhar hated this, for he longed to be a soldier. Meanwhile, he did what he could and waited for an opportunity to serve the South. He was sure that the opportunity would come. Then he would do whatever he was asked, would be willing to face any danger. One evening Farquhar and his wife were sitting on a bench near the entrance to his land. Just then a soldier dressed in gray rode up to the gate and asked for a drink of water. Mrs. Farquhar was happy to serve the soldier, for his gray uniform revealed that he was a soldier from the South. While she was getting the water, Farquhar approached the dusty horseman and inquired eagerly for news from the front. The man shook his head and said, Soldiers from the north are getting ready to advance. They have reached the Owl Creek Bridge and are preparing to send soldiers and supplies over it. Their commander has issued an order, which has been posted everywhere. I saw the order. It warns everyone to stay away from the bridge. Anyone caught interfering with the bridge will be hanged. How far is it to the Owl Creek Bridge, asked Farquhar. About 30 miles. Are there many soldiers from the north on this side of the bridge? There is just a small squad half a mile away. And there is one guard with a rifle at this end of the bridge. Suppose a man could get around the squad. Suppose he was able to overpower the guard, said Farquhar, smiling. What could he do then? 
What could he accomplish? The soldier thought for a moment. He could do much damage. He said, he could destroy the bridge and prevent the north from advancing. I was there a month ago. I noticed that last winter's flood had thrown a great deal of driftwood against the wooden pier of the bridge. It is now very dry and would burn very quickly. Farquhar smiled again, and at that moment his wife returned with the water, which the soldier drank. He thanked her politely, bowed to them both, then rode away. An hour later, when it was dark, he headed back in the direction from which he had come. A man was a spy a spy for the north. Part 3. As Peyton Farquhar fell straight down from the bridge, he lost consciousness, and was as one already dead. He was awakened from the state ages later, it seemed to him by a sharp pain in his throat. He also felt as though he were choking. Pain seemed to shoot downward from his neck to every part of his body. He could not think, could only feel, and what he felt was torment. And then, suddenly, he became aware that he was falling. All at once, the light around him flashed upward, and there was a loud splash. There was a roaring in his ears, and everything was cold and dark. Suddenly, he could think again. He knew that the rope had broken and that he had fallen into the stream. The noose around his neck was choking him, but it kept the water from reaching his lungs. To die of hanging at the bottom of a river. The idea seemed crazy, absurd to him. He opened his eyes and saw above him a gleam of light, but how distant it was, how far away. He was still sinking, for the light was getting fainter and fainter, until it was merely a glimmer. Then the light began to grow brighter, and he knew that B was rising to the surface of the water. He regretted that because he knew that the soldiers would see him. To be hanged and drowned, he thought, that is not so bad. But I do not wish also to be shot. No, I will not be shot. That is not fair. A sharp pain in his wrists told him that he was trying to free his hands. He was not even aware that he was trying to do that. It was as though someone else were involved in the struggle. Still, he tried with all his strength to get free. And then the cord tells away, his arms parted, and he floated upward. As the light grew brighter, he could see his hands. They tore at the moose around his neck. They ripped off the rope. His neck ached horribly, and his brain was on fire. His heart felt as though it were going to explode. But his hands pounded fiercely at the water, beating it downward, forcing him up to the surface. He felt his head emerge. It was now out of the water. His eyes were blinded by the sunlight. He took a huge breath and filled his lungs with air. He was now in control of himself. He felt the water rippling against his face, heard the sound as the water splashed against him. He looked at the forest on the bank of the river. He saw the trees, saw them clearly, saw the leaves with the insects on them. He saw flies and gray spiders spinning their webs from twig to twig. He saw rainbow-colored dewdrops glistening on the blades of grass. A fish slid along beneath his eyes and he heard the rush of its body moving through the water. He had come to the surface facing down the stream. He turned his head and saw the bridge. He saw the soldiers on the bridge, the captain, and the sergeant. He saw their dark shadows against the blue sky. They shouted and pointed at him. The captain had drawn his pistol, but he did not fire. Suddenly he heard a sharp cracking sound and something struck the water a few inches away from his face. He heard a second shot and saw one of the guards, his rifle raised, a thin cloud of blue smoke rising from the mouth of the gun. The man in the water saw the eye of the guard gazing at him through the sights of the rifle. He saw that it was a gray eye, and he remembered having read that gray eye were the sharpest, that all famous sharpshooters had them. Still, this one had missed. A current had caught Farquhar and turned him halfway around. He was now looking toward the forest. Suddenly the sound of a high, clear voice rang out behind him. It traveled loudly and distinctly across the water. Although he was no solider, Farquhar knew the meaning of that command. His body turned cold as he heard those cruel words, Attention Company. Ready. Aim. Fire. Part 4. Farquhar dived, dived as deeply as he could. The water roared like thunder in his ears, but still he heard the dull sound of shots. He rose again to the surface, and as he did, shining bits of metal hit him on the face and hands. Gasping for breath, he looked around and saw that he had drifted further down the stream, nearer to safety. The soldiers had almost finished reloading their rifles. They fired again, but did not hit him. The hunted man saw all this over his shoulder. 
He was now swimming strongly, vigorously, with the current. Suddenly he felt himself whirling around and around, spinning like a top. The water, the forest, the faraway bridge, the men all of them flew by his eyes in a blur. He was being whirled with such speed, he felt dizzy and sick. Then, suddenly, he was flung up onto the shore far away from his enemies. He was safe, but could hardly believe it. He dug his fingers into the sand and threw handfuls of it all over himself. He shouted with joy. He wept with delight. He looked around at the trees near him on the show. They seemed to him like giant garden plants. A strange, beautiful light shone through their branches. The breeze rustling through the leaves was like music to his ears. He would have liked to remain in that enchanted spot. Shots in the branches high above his head caused him to change his mind at once. He quickly jumped to his feet, nested further up the shore, and plunged into the forest. All that day he traveled. The forest seemed interminable. It went on and on forever. Nowhere could be find a break in the woods, not even a path. He had not known that he lived in so wild a region. There was something strange in this discovery. By nightfall he was aching, fatigued, and very hungry, but he had his heart set on seeing his wife and children, and that urged him on. At last, he found a road that led in what he knew was the right direction. It was as wide and straight as a city street, yet there was no one on it. There were no houses anywhere. He did not even hear the barking of a dog. His neck was in pain, and when he lifted his hand to it, he found that it was very sore. He knew that there must be a black circle where the rope had been tied around it. His eyes felt so swollen he could no longer close them. His tongue was hot and dry with thirst. He opened his mouth to let in some alt. How soft the grass was on the path. He could no longer feel the road beneath his feet. Probably even though he was suffering, he had fallen asleep while walking. Now he sees another scene. He stands at the gate of his own house. Everything is just as he left it, bright and beautiful in the morning sunlight. He must have traveled the entire night. He pushes open the gate and walks up the wide white walk. He sees a flutter of female clothing and his wife, looking fresh and cool and sweet, comes down from the porch to meet him. At the bottom of the steps, she stands waiting. Her face is smiling and filled with joy. Ah, how beautiful she is. He rushes forward with extended arms. As he about to hug her, he feels a stunning blow on the back of his neck. A blinding white light plays all around him. There is a loud, crashing sound, then all is darkness and silence. Peyton Farquhar was dead. His body, with a broken neck, swung gently from side to side beneath the timbers of the Owl Creek Bridge.